to Small Scale Adventures where we're cracking on with Project C44KM. Going to have a look through building the gearbox and putting the chassis parts together this evening. So I've chosen to use the C34 single speed gearbox for this build. Um, and because that comes disassembled, we're going to have to put that together first before we can start on the rest of the chassis. So we've got a gearbox casing parts, we've got a motor and reduction box, uh, and here's the, the little bag of screws and fixings that comes with that gearbox, gearbox set. And we've got the drive shafts and metal gears from inside that. So we're going to pop these things out over here, find a place to put them in a mo, uh, and we need our motor and we need our gearbox casing and we need the motor half of the gearbox casing. Uh, and that's gonna go in like so. Uh, line up the two screw holes um, and put in the machine screws. And I'm sure they are in the little bag here. There's one, two machine screws, M3 screws for screwing into the motor going to pop a little bit of thread lock on the end of them before they go in because I don't want this coming loose. Thread lock in there, a little bit of thread lock in there. go do be careful when you're holding your motor that you're not interfering with the contacts on the other end don't want to tweak those up too tight because they are on the plastic housing we don't want to crush or damage the plastic housing in any way there we go those fittings are in and the first gear we need is the one with the shaft coming out of the front. And we're gonna pop that on so it lines up with the flat on the motor. But currently that position is interfering with the post that holds the part together. We can't get the Allen wrench in there to do up the grub screw. So we're gonna need a pair of long nose pliers to rotate the motor round. You probably won't manage it with your fingers uh, because of the, the gear ratios inside that reduction box. So just grip that with the pliers and rotate it round so it's long ways down the gearbox casing. Then we can get ready to pop that one on. Gonna need a grub screw, gonna need a little blob of thread lock on there. And I'm going to do that up so it's not quite touching the plastic casing. Obviously I don't want that running against the plastic casing in use. Tweak that up and that is in position and ready to go. The second gear sits on a shaft and I'm going to pop that together with the grub screw dry for the moment because it's quite tricky to get it the right way round and the first time I assembled one of these I uh, did it completely wrong. So we want our shaft in that way pointing out towards the front of the gearbox to take the drive gear and we want this gear this way around. 
to sit on the bearing inside and I think that's right pop that grub screw in for a mo make sure that picks up on the flat on the shaft and what we should have now is space for a bearing in front and a bearing behind so we'll slide that ball race on there slide that ball race on there that will sit in that side of the casing and we have a third ball race on the end of the motor gear just to carry that and that all goes together inside the casing like so I'm happy with that we've got our forward output shaft we've got our rearward output shaft and that casing will close up once we are all together so pop that back out pop that gear out of there and get some Loctite on that one bearings in place bearings stayed inside the gearbox casing on the other side there and let's get some grease on those gears Lovely, they're all lubed up. Pop the casing back on. Should click into place. And then a couple of self tapper gear, self tapper screws. to fix the gearbox casing together. Don't pick up your Allen driver when you want a number one Phillips. Again, we're not gonna go crazy with the tightness on these. They're into plastic. The plastic will stretch and strip really easily. So we're just gonna tweak them up just so. And there's our gearbox ready to go into the chassis. A little bit of casting, moulding flash on there. Pop him to one side. And we'll have a look at the drive shafts in a little while. Um, so now we're on to the instructions. We're having a look at getting the shocks together. I've got my shock bag over here. Then you get all the shock plastic parts out, shock bodies, shock caps and um, rod ends all over the table. Here we've got our suspension links in this bag with the springs and the shock shafts. So I'm just going to get the springs out. There we go. One shock shaft on the table. Cut the 
shop shaft still in the bag. Put them over there. So, shock bodies. Shock shafts go into the shock bodies. Springs go in. And then the caps go on. But before we put the spring and the cap on, you'll see that there is a cross head on the top of the shaft that will enable you to fit the rod ends to the bottom of the shafts without having to grip the shaft with pliers, which stops them getting damaged. Wind that in till you feel the slightest resistance. Don't keep twisting it in, otherwise you will strip or crack the rod end. And there we go, there's our shock together. Spring can go in. Before we pop the spring in, I'm just gonna put some grease on it. Adds a little bit of damping inside. Don't fill it up. You don't want it to act like a plunger in there, but that keeps the suspension working smoothly. And then cap on. A little bit of flash on the bottom of that from the injection molding. Let's get rid of that. And then you'll do that four more times. Now we've got the shocks built, we are working on the chassis rails and we have to put the ball pickup points onto the chassis rails first of all. So looking at the instructions, we need one, two, three, four on the right hand chassis rail. We need one, two, three on the left hand chassis rail. I assembled four and four the first time I did this uh, because I was anticipating a standard four link setup. I wasn't anticipating the panhard rod um, arrangement that is one of the highlights of the C34 and C44 chassis. Those over there for now.
There are nylock nuts in the fixings bags. Is the right hand rail done? Cold fingers, I can't pick up the nuts. And at the front of that right hand chassis rail, we want one of these ball studs just in the bottom of the two holes. It's nice that WPL have included the, the chassis mount holes um, and the hardware that you need if you do want to assemble these kits as a traditional four link like the C14 and 24 chassis. Chassis rails are done, so we are moving on to looking at the chassis cross members, um, installing the shocks, um, ready to build the axle links and uh, assemble the axles onto the chassis. So at the rear end, we have a cross member that mounts into these two holes. Never quite sure which way up it's supposed to go. I think it's open side up. And we'll use two of the flanged nuts, two of the flanged screws to hold that in position. the front cross member with the on off switch section to the front of the vehicle 
goes in that end. And we need to pop the bumper irons on in that front screw hole as well. Again, these are metal fixings into plastic parts, so they don't need to be superhero tight. Just give them a tweak. Don't strip or stretch the plastic that they're fitting into. go and on the bottom of the servo tray we need to install a fourth ball stud um, and that's the, the chassis pickup point for the panhard rod that screws in there so that's another metal fixing cutting its own thread into a plastic part it does need a bit of force to get it to pick up in there do not over tighten this one either because this will strip quite easily. So there's the panhard pickup mounted in position uh, and now we're going to have a look at the shocks. I've forgotten that the shocks really ought to go on before the other parts um, because particularly at the front it is quite tricky to get the, the screwdriver in. But we'll go with it because this is where we are now. So the shocks fit in the, the lower of the two mounting holes there. And they want to be in with quite a bit of play. They don't want to be tightened up to the chassis. So flange head self tappers again. Keep the angle as low as you can to the chassis as you're mounting them. Out of the way. There we go. 
I can get into those nicely now. Probably worth doing this when you assemble. So that's plenty tight enough. They want plenty of float on there. Um, in the past, I've assembled these with a little rubber O-ring in that position there. Just take some of the rattle out of them. But for now, we are putting everything together with what's supplied in the kit. If you do the shocks up too tight, you will find that they cause the, the plastic moulding to bulge on the inside and that prevents uh, the full travel of the suspension unit. There we go, front suspension on. Let's put that servo tray back into position. building the longer wheelbase C44 so those suspension units go in the rearmost holes for the longer wheelbase. go our shocks are all in position we are ready to move on need to save a little bit of flash on the end of this ball joint so let's give that a trim there we go and then it is motor in so we go in with the motor to the front of the vehicle and we should just be able to pull the chassis rails out to get that into position. And you can see how high that mounts in the chassis um, and keeps uh, the underside of the car nice and open for, for best crawling performance. I also really like the C34 chassis, C34 motor, uh, and gearbox because it has outputs that rotate in opposite directions so you don't get any of the torque twist that turns the vehicle to one side while it's driving along. Instructions state that we should be using the larger flange screws to carry the gearbox. They seem to be taking quite some persuasion to get in. Those self-tapping screws are in the gearbox bag so you won't have them unless you have got the C34 gearbox. There are links to the official store in the description of the video so you can grab your C34 gearbox. You might be thinking C34 has got a shorter wheelbase, how's that going to work in the longer C44? Well one of the great things about buying this uh, C34 KM gearbox for C44 use is it comes with an extra long rear drive shaft so that you can mount it in the C44 chassis.
really need to re-magnetize the tips of this screwdriver. one of the few places on assembling these chassis that a slightly larger screwdriver would come in handy. Pop that back into the chassis. motor and gearbox in so now we need to have a little adjust on the table get these brass parts out of the way pop the gearbox bag to one side until we need those shaft prop shafts and parts a little later on And flick our instructions over and we're looking at assembling the trusses onto the axles and setting up the linkage rods and then we'll get the axles mounted on the chassis as well for trusses I have made the uh, order of getting some um, of the metal C3444 trusses um, previous users proved these are a really good buy got links for these down in the description. Let's start with our rear axle. Let's start with our front axle. So front axle we need the steering arms on the knuckles facing forwards and we're going to pop the trusses on. So we want our longer machine screws and they pop through from the top of the truss through the hole in the axle and into the metal fixing underneath. Do these up loosely individually to start with, um, just so you know you've got everything in position, ready to go. Sometimes paint on the inside of the holes makes them a little tricky to Assemble. Sometimes just being a bit ham fisted makes them tricky to assemble. Of course we assembled the axles in the first episode of this build so when we come to this point building up the chassis we run smoothly through into fitting the suspension um, and continuing on we don't have to stop and do the axle build this is why I always build the axles first once all four are through give them a tweak up now I know some people recommend using thread lock on all of your metal to metal fixings but I have never had these come loose so I'm not going to worry about that today I know it's the kind of part that I'm going to want to dismantle again in the future um, so I don't want it super tight and hard to undo there we go F front axle truss is on rear axle is going to need to be on the same side as the front axle because of those counter rotating outputs so and i'm going to build that one that way up and when we build the front axle we want to check that um, the offset um, 
input cover is on the same side as the output. That gives us as much clearance as possible to the motor casing. So the rear axle is going on that way round. You can see the pan hard rod mount on the um, axle truss there. Not using that on the rear axle, um, but it is there because the trusses aren't set up front to rear, they are just the same at both ends. made my own mistake then and tightened them up before I add the other end in. So the lower pickup points on the trusses on the axles have the double ball socket on the front and the rear. And the upper ones have the balls that fit on the M3 screws. So there's our double ball sockets. Put them into the lower joint. at the front our tie rod in position at this point so we're looking for the tie rod with the cranked ends we have got another pair of rod ends to screw onto that again it's critical with these tie rods that you do not attempt to make them too short the tie rods will strip and split and just underneath where I've put that bag down you can see that WPL have provided information in the instructions for how long each of these linkages need to be. I'm going to pop that in that way that one on the other end and we'll see how we are for the hundred millimeters that they recommend it wants to be flat don't want any lift from the rod ends at each end And the diagram shows 100 millimeters to the outside edges of the rod ends. I'm still a little long there, so I'm going to give it half a turn on that end. And I'd expect to take these off again once I start driving the truck anyway. 
just to make sure the steering geometry is right as we go. We'll take half a turn off there. And there we are. Now we want the ball joints that came in the steering bag and we want the ones with the shortest flanges. We don't want to be using these longer flanged parts at this point because there's no um, up and down as well as left and right movement on these. They only move in one plane so they don't need lifting off the crank arm on the knuckle. Pop those balls in. They will be pretty tight at first, um, but they'll soon bed in. If you do find that your balls are too tight, that's quite a problem. So that one's quite loose already. This one seems to have gone in quite tight. Let's see if wiggling it loosens it up. If you do find they are way too tight in the rod ends, get a pair of pliers, give it a slight squeeze, and you'll find that should loosen it up. Do that once or twice. Don't be He-Man. And that's loosened that up nicely, and that's ready to install. So we want to install it to the bottom of the car, and it installs in those inner outer two holes there. So you see what we've got is a wider angle at the front through the kingpin towards the rear of the car. And that introduces Ackerman angle into the steering, meaning that the inner wheel can turn at a tighter radius than the outer wheel, preventing tire scrub and giving better steering action. Use one of our short machine screws into the crank arm there and it's a common mistake that people fit it into the inner two holes the furthest out on the crank arm um, and that's where some mistakes have been made in the past with builders assuming that the tie rod link is too long for the car Give that a tweak. You might, once you've finished adjusting the steering geometry, decide you want to put some thread lock on those screws um, just to keep them done up nice and tight. And there you can see why we've got that crank in the rod, just so we've got plenty of clearance um, on the diff cover there um, to give great steering angle. And there's the front axle ready to go to one side. Not going to assemble the servo link for now because uh, I'm not mounting the servo in the car until I assemble the electrics. So chassis to one side, axles to one side and we are ready to have a look at these suspension links. Pan hard rod linkage is 56 millimeters end to end and that uses one of the shorter suspension links. That started. And be careful not to wind these rod ends on too long, too short, uh, because you will strip and split the rod end. So we are aiming for 56 millimeters. And I think that's at the shorter end of the travel for these. Can be quicker to uh, wind them on use a screwdriver through the rod end but that can lead to you over stressing them and splitting them so don't do it too enthusiastically we are at 
six stay still. And that is the length that we need for the three front. Suspension links that is screwed in all the way now. I'm just going to see how we go with this one. Looking at the thread distance, we have got a way we can get in yet. It's hurting my finger, so I'm just going to wind that on until I feel the resistance, and we'll see where we are. We are at 67 ish. I'm just going to try and get another half turn on each end to shorten them as much as possible. It doesn't want to get any shorter. There we go, I think we're at about 56, excellent. And I've just remembered I didn't put the upper pan hard rod link on the front axle, so I'm gonna do that now. There's another of our M3 ball studs, and that screws into the thread on there. Front axle links, 60. So that was about halfway down the threaded section of the suspension shaft. Ends. And we're at just over 60 there. One more turn should do it. And I have seen quite a few people adjust these linkages back out again to 61, 62 millimeters. Um, to push the axle slightly further forward and give the rig a slightly more scale looking appearance um, with the front wheels pushed forward in the wheel wells as per a real life FJ. good to me. There's our shorter pan hard link.
Oh, not a bit far with that one. Wind him back out. Cracking. Let's get the front axle mounted. And we pop those rod ends onto the inner most ball. And we'll pop, I uh, have used a short one there. That is the pan hard link. to assemble the cross screw, the ball, and those balls fit into the gap in the truss. Another place where you don't want to do it up too tight. Nylock is on there ready to a bit of flash on the bottom of that rod end catching on a pumpkin there. So there we go, we've got our suspension links in. And it's just a case of popping them onto the chassis. So the upper link goes to the upper hole on the inside of the chassis rail there. Lower link to the lower hole. Give it a fiddle in between the motor. Pop that one. Pan hard link in position and popped in and then shocks on the outside and that is our front axle mounted check you got nice free movement throughout no binding on there and you can see the pan hard link going across um, which when we mount the servo in position helps eliminate the bump steer from um, the axle moving on the, the radius rods that link it to the chassis. At the back end we just need our uh, conventional four link set up with the longer rods and we are looking at assembling them to 82 millimeters long. Oh, I've got a couple of trucks that had that pushed out a little bit further. Another exciting segment of the video watching me make the ends of my fingers hurt. than I thought. And we've gone a bit short there. A couple of turns off that end, take a couple of turns off that end. 
82. Sure, I end to take that one back out again. Be good. Nearly there. Haven't mounted the servo in this part of the video because I know I want to connect it up to the electrics and centre that servo before assembly um, and then get the servo horn that actuates the steering fitted once it's centred so I don't have to take it off and do it again. down a touch and back out a touch and two Nice to see that there are a few spare rod ends in the pack. You will eventually get some breakages. Particularly if you are trailing hard. Lovely, and there's our four rear linkages. And we can get the rear axle on much the same way as the front. Two linkages go onto the upper mounting point with the M3 machine screw. And the two larger balls. It's a longer. Flanges on them.
and there we are suspension at both ends of the chassis prop shaft to to build up and mount and then we will be good to continue with the electrics and the body Could feel a slight bind in one of those rear shocks, reducing the travel because I've screwed the screws in too far. Let's hope it's not permanent. Let's see, that's looking good now. So there we go, we have got our chassis built. Gonna move on to making the prop shafts. And all we got to do now is get the prop shafts made. So we've got our prop shaft box uh, tub over here um, and we'll get them connected up to the axles. Got some heat shrink here which I'm going to slide over the prop shaft cups once everything's assembled uh, and that will keep the springs and bars in place um, should anything come loose. So we'll flip our chassis over to start with. I want the sleeve in the axle end to keep a bit more clearance to the motor casing. Also stops the sleeve section acting like a scoop and scooping up mud and grot, binding the drive shafts. Where did that bounce to? It stuck to the magnet of the motor. That was handy. Bar in. And that's gone home nicely. We'll slide the split pin round. Just using my nail and twisting that to feed it into position. The split pin's on. And then I'll pop the heat shrink over it. This is the right sized heat shrink. Some of the other heat shrink I've got left, it won't pull down quite as tight as this, unfortunately. And then the other end of the shaft, I'm going to build up off the car. Another pin, another bar, and another ring. goes and I've gone home it's easier to put the split rings on from the other end because you just pull them across and rotate my motor shaft round to bring the flat to the top Uh, 
is. I can see that nicely from this side. Get the axle together. Pop the prop shaft in. And I will probably find I can't quite get it on to. go that is in position but I haven't cut my heat shrink I will pop that off pop the heat shrink over and try it again Position, grab a grub screw, Tweak. Slide the heat shrink into position. And have another shrink. Do for now, can have a look back at that in a moment. And on to the other end. Again, I want to make sure I rotate my output shaft round so that I can see it from the top of the act, top of the chassis. And then I want to get my cup in position. So there's a little burr on the end of this pin and it doesn't want to go in. There we go. It's through. really doesn't want to go home. As annoying as it is, I think I'm going to have to take that one back out again. There, it's gone. There we go. And we can get the split ring on.
run that on. And then just the extended shaft to build for the rear. I do like that long shaft, that would have come in handy for lots of previous product projects. Pop that on over the axle, over the output shafts. And I've forgotten my heat shrink again. position A tweak. Really pulled down as tidy as I'd like. But as I say, it's the wrong size heat shrink. I should have been using the next size down, but I don't have any left in stock. Yeah, it's not pulled down too badly after all. So there we go. There we have our chassis built up, ready to go. Thanks for watching guys, uh, that brings to an end the second instalment of our C44KM build. We've got a chassis up together, you can see the fabulous ground clearance that that C34 gearbox offers. Um, really looking forward to cracking on with this one next time. 
we shall build up the electrics and then we shall build up body and get everything together working nicely if you've enjoyed the video please do subscribe to the channel we've got shorts we've got product tests we've got modifications everything you could want if you're into WPL trucks um, looking forward to seeing you again next time guys thanks again for watching